This episode is proudly supported by Powerhouse Parramatta. Powerhouse Parramatta will open in 2025. The new museum will be the largest in New South Wales and is determined to offer the very best in hospitality. Perhaps your business can be part of defining a food and beverage offering which is expected to cater to 2 million visitors a year. This incredible opportunity for operators includes retail food and beverage, in-house residential catering, events and other hospitality ventures, encapsulating the diversity of cuisines and cultures that make Western Sydney so exciting. Interested to learn more? Powerhouse invites food and beverage operators to a briefing on Tuesday 8th of August. For more information and to register for this exclusive briefing, go to powerhouse.com. You're running on adrenaline, which is, it's addictive. It's almost like a drug, if you can say, Um, a good Mm. service with great customers who are, who are just thrilled of what you've sort of done and put out. And uh, that feels just amazing. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. With the evolution of regional dining has come a focus on capturing a true sense of place with food. Food that speaks of a region, of a place, of a period in time. In that sense, what is Tasmanian cuisine? How does the produce and climate of the Apple Isle play a role in its voice on the plate? Tim Hardy is a co-owner and executive chef of Van Bone Restaurant and Farm in Tasmania. Tim, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you, Anthony. How are you going? I'm good. Tell us a little bit about the region that Van Bone is is in. I know you're quite connected to the produce and the region there. Yeah, of course. So um, Van Bone is, uh, it's about 45 minutes kind of east-southeast of Hobart in a little area called Brim Creek. It's predominantly dairy country, really beautiful green rolling hills um, and right on the east coast of Tasmania, looking north up towards Mariah Island. It's a beautiful part of Tasmania with Mm. some really wonderful produce kind of happening from the area. Uh, There's a few little market gardens um, in the area there's a couple of vineyards we're actually next door to brim creek vineyard um fred peacock making some lovely wines there um there's oyster farms just a couple of k's away so yeah it's a beautiful beautiful area um with some yeah wonderful produce there's an amazing cheese company just up the road uh tongola farm making beautiful goat's cheese Mm. so yeah it's a pretty pretty awesome happening little area there. Tell us a little bit about your small scale philosophy that you you have there for the venue. Yeah, well, um, Van Bone. It's it's about an eighteen seat restaurant. We we sort of book out anywhere between ten and sixteen guests at this stage in time. Um, we have a small little garden that we basically just used solely for the kitchen. We really haven't bought vegetables for, look, about the last six months now. So wow. very much um, in tune with, with our little patch down there. We, our very small team head down every morning, pick the day's produce, um, exactly the right portions every single day for our diners. So, you know, we, we pick and it's on the plate within a couple of hours. So... So it's a beautiful way to cook and having sort of cooked this way now, it's hard to think there's any other way to do it. (laughs) Tell us a little bit about the the produce that you're perhaps using at the moment that sort of speaks of, of the voice that you're giving to that region. Yeah, of course. I mean, it, it's ever changing. Um, we're just sort of coming out of uh, summer now. So the garden's in a bit of a transition with getting our, our autumn winter crops established. So we're still pretty lucky to be able to be serving tomatoes. Um, we've got amazing cucumbers that are still hanging in there. And then, yeah, we've got lots of sort of brassicas, cabbages, that kind of stuff happening a little slowly. Um, as as winter kicked in, that, that'll be the next sort of round of produce. But we've got an enormous amount of leafy greens, radishes, hakari turnips, um, like I said, tomatoes are still hanging in there. Cucumbers are amazing. There, there's so much. I mean, 
it's it's hard to list everything, but like I said, <laughs> it's basically everything on the menu is is coming from the pats, apart from proteins, etc. Well, I want to explore in more detail what you're doing at Van Bone there, but take us back to when you were young. What sort of role did food play in your family? Well, I mean, we we always ate really well. It it, it was never you know, on a culinary level of, you know, we're a chef family or anything. Um, mum mm. and dad, we, we grew up in a pretty small little town about 20 kilometres east of Hobart. It's called Cremorne. It's on a little sand spit. And on the inside, there's a pipe clay lagoon. And it's full of oyster leases. So as young kids, we'd, we'd paddle our surfboards out there and, and pick wild oysters. Um, wow which sort of, you know, spawned from the farms. Um, but, yeah, food was food was always, you know, it was just good quality food. Mum and Dad were pretty solid cooks. You know, Mum would do awesome spaghetti bolognese and, and that kind of stuff. But like I said, it was never, you know, on a culinary level. We just ate good quality food. Mum and Dad always had a little veggie patch and I remember – picking corn as a very young kid, which was always good fun. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, yeah, just, just good solid food. Um, yeah. What triggered an interest for you to, for a career as a chef? Well, it's sort of interesting. I, I'd always enjoyed uh, cooking classes at school and, and never really thought I was going to, you know, be be a chef or anything like that. I was a very keen surfer, so that kind of ruled my life for, for many, many years, and it still does in a way. Um, so I, I ended up getting a job as a kitchen hand and working nights just because it was perfect for surfing. So I'd surf all day. <laughs> I'd head into the kitchens, um, get a good feed off the chefs and, and wash dishes till late at night and get up and do it all again. And I was doing that for quite a few years and just sort of, you know, really chasing waves and that allowed me to do that. And then I got offered an apprenticeship at one of the restaurants I was working at and kind of told mum and, and she was said, you have to do it. You can't sort of be a surfer your whole life. Um <laughs> So uh, I accepted it and it was a massive shock, you know. I mean, the hours and, and the dedication to the craft is enormous. So it was a huge shock. The first few years were just kind of grinding it out and I'm not sure something clicked later in my career and, and it was, yeah, surfing was on the back door and, and cooking became number one. So that's kind of how it started in a nutshell. Um and, yeah, it's evolved enormously since. What's been some of the key sort of venues and people that have influenced your direction as a chef? Well, I mean, as I finished my apprenticeship in, in Tassie at a small restaurant in Hobart and I packed my car, drove straight to Western Australia, down to the <laughs> Margaret, down to the Margaret River region, um, knowing the surf was really good there. So... I drove over there and ended up getting a job at, at Vas Felix Winery. Um, Aaron Carr was the chef at the time. Mm. And he's been an enormous influential uh, figure in my career. I haven't sort of chatted with him for a few years now, but that was a, an amazing time. Um, just, you know, the surf was incredible. They were doing really good food at Vas Felix and, and I just clicked with Az. He's a great guy and, and he just mixed fun and, and good cooking and a good time into into the scene and it just really resonated with me. Um, so I ended up going back and forth from Tassie to WA many times and and the Vas Felix sort of grew from strength to strength each time and, you know, they'd won sort of every award and Aaron was – a bit of a star in the West Oz scene over there. So, mm. yeah, he was a big influence. Um, working with Luke Burgess very briefly at Garage East in Hobart, mm. that, was, that was huge. Um, uh, Luke's a pretty inspired guy and, yeah, he he really inspired me to, to want to achieve at a, at a high level. So... I'd sort of left there. I ended up working at, at Lake House in Dalesford for oh, wow. almost a year under Brendan Wessels. He was sous chef there. 
Um, I'm not sure exactly where he is now, but um, he was an amazing guy, just extremely eloquent and a really solid cook who, yeah, I got along really well with and he was a big inspiration. Um, and then, I mean, Dan Hunter, how, how do you go past Dan? Working at Bray in that kitchen, probably the most inspired chef I've, I've ever had the pleasure of working under. Um, just just incredible from, you know, the food philosophy to the way he talks about food and, and everything they're doing on Bray Farm there is inspired from, you know, as soon as you get in the driveway to being in that beautiful old farmhouse. It's, it's just incredible. So, yeah, Dan sort of working with him, it, it really inspired me to kind of come home and, and do something on a, well, certainly not a, a Bray level, but something similar, you know, farm to plate cooking in a regional area. Um, and, yeah, here we are at Van Bone Restaurant. You've worked at some pretty incredible and influential restaurants, but it's really marked by being regional restaurants. What, yeah. what, what's your, been your interest about, you know, carving a career in regional restaurants and what impact has that had on you? Well, I think the whole regional thing, it's, it's really beautiful to, to go into a region, to immerse yourself within that and, and discover a food experience. It, it really, it just made sense to me. Um, I think that whole kind of being a part of the community and the region showcasing that region has always appealed to me. Mm. And I feel like there's there's always been these, you know, incredible restaurants in sort of far off regions that are almost sort of intriguing. You know, you have to go there because it's it's a discovery within itself. And then for them to be able to showcase that region in such a, a powerful and inspired way, it, it's always really resonated with me. Um, so I, I suppose that's kind of it. And, I mean, it, it, a lot of the time these regions have had really good surf nearby. So, I mean, that was, <laughs> that was always really good as a surfer too. You had a small stint uh, in a Swede, in Sweden as well. Can you tell us a bit about that and, and what impact it had on you? Yeah, that was an amazing experience. Um, I, I was sort of working at Vas Felix at the time and, and the Great Escape or Gourmet Escape, I think it, it is mm. a big event down in Margaret River. Um, and, yeah, I just saw this Swedish chef was a part of it. I'd never heard of Daniel, Daniel Berlin or his restaurant, and I just Googled him and went, wow, that guy's sort of like my one of my food heroes, Magnus Nielsen. So I, I just emailed the restaurant and said, can I come and stage? Um, and and I, got a, I got an email back from his sous chef, um, and they said, when can you come? So I ended up flying over to Sweden and did a one-month stage there. Um, it ended up being a little bit longer because I wanted to stay. And mm. it was just an amazing time. Daniel operated a 12-seat little farmhouse in the middle of nowhere in southern Sweden. And he was doing very sort of Nordic, seasonal, just incredible food. And, and I loved that style. I think the whole Noma movement and Edmund Magnus opening Farvican in just the absolute middle of nowhere inspired me heavily. So to go work with Daniel doing something similar was just incredible. Um, they had an amazing charcuterie program. Daniel would go hunting on days off and bring wild boar back on his back into the restaurant and they'd butcher it. And it was just like, wow, this is this is insane and just amazing. And they were cooking at such a high level. It was just really an incredible experience. I think the next year they'd cracked the the top 100 in the, mm. in the second Greeno Awards. So it, it felt amazing to have sort of jumped on something before it really blew up like that. And to see that was, was really cool. Inspired by all of all of this, as you mentioned, you wanted to open your own place back in Tasmania. What were the yep. challenges and hurdles early on in trying to create sort of your vision? 
Well, I mean, it's it's been a, a pretty wild ride, to be honest. Um, to to dig a hole in a in a empty paddock in you know essentially the middle of nowhere and say we're building a restaurant um, is pretty wild in itself. Um, so yeah, that that happened about. Oh, look, five years ago, the hole was dug. We were pretty excited. Yeah, we're building a restaurant. Um, and, I mean, anybody who's built from the ground up knows there's enormous challenges within that in, in itself, um, financially, all of that. It was – I'd never mm-hmm. set foot on a building site before, so ended up kind of being thrown into the deep end and, and helping trades along the way. Uh me and my business partner, who's not really in the business anymore, but um, we we ended up doing quite a bit of labouring. We we laboured for building the the four metre high rammed earth walls that are a huge part of the restaurant. That was really cool, um, and yeah, very very much a part of it. But yeah, building is challenging in itself. To say, you know, you're going to be a restaurant um, without, you know, any financial backing, that's huge. And then COVID mm. hit. And we were like, wow, we've just thrown four years of enormous energy into this thing and, and the industry's just gone to shit. So what do we do? Um, so we... We got to the point where it was like the building's ready. Um, let's just open and see what happens. Um, we'd thrown everything into it at that stage, and yeah, we opened the doors. And a year and a half later, it's kind of surreal, but it's just gone from strength to strength. And yeah, we're thrilled. With with that timing of COVID and your vision, did it did it alter because of um, COVID what you had intended to open? No, not at all. I mean, we, we always wanted to um, open a, you know, a really small regional destination style uh, restaurant. We'd always wanted to do degustation menus and we have, haven't changed really anything. Um, the, the model of the restaurant is is very COVID uh, sort of safe, I suppose, being really small, um, mm. not needing enormous amount of staffing or or numbers to be successful so without even realizing it we'd um we'd opened a pretty pretty good covid model really um but no nothing had changed we we've stayed very true to the vision and it's it's been amazing really um just a lot of hard work but extremely rewarding and yeah the restaurants somehow kind of won some pretty cool awards and uh, there's a lot of talk, which is great. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the design of, of the, the restaurant, but also of the surrounding sort of grounds and orchard and, and garden, because I know you've had a few uh, people involved and, and yep. that's really important to what you do. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's that call of, you know, it it takes an army to build a village and very much the same to do something what we're doing. So my fiance, Laura Stukin, who is um, the restaurant manager, she designed the building. So she was an interior architect and has had a Mm. major change. So she designed the building. Uh, many years ago, and it is incredible. It's very architecturally designed, big rammed earth walls. It's sort of tucked in to a hillside. Um, lots yeah. of wonderful angles, and it's it's a really in, just awe inspired looking building. Um, we have enormous windows throughout, so the dining room is very open and just incredible views from every sort of table and vista. The kitchen's basically in the middle of the restaurant um, where, you know, the diners can come up and chat or or that. We're we're very much in the dining room as such. Uh, Mm. We cook entirely on fire. We don't have any gas in the restaurant. We do have a few electric sort of appliances, but it's about 90% cooked over coals and fire. Um, And then, yeah, I mean, the garden was designed by a local permaculturalist, Hannah Maloney, who's pretty influential in sort of the Hobart scene with permaculture. So she designed it. 
and we've sort of slowly implemented it over the years. Uh, we now have a gardener, Stewie, who's a legend, and he's been <laughs> really, really great in, in just keeping the patch really moving, and he's very good with with that. Um, it's myself and Laura in the restaurant. I'm the executive chef. She's the, the manager, and we have a fourth-year apprentice in the kitchen, and that's basically the team. Um, wow. Very small. Um, we work enormous hours, but you know our customers get a lot out of it. We're we're the ones who built it and designed it. We're the ones that are running it. So everyone gets to talk to us and and understand the story. Tell us a little bit about your food, and is there a dish or two you can sort of tell us about that sort of epitomizes where you're at as a chef? Yeah, I mean, my food, it's pretty, I mean, the whole cliche of, of seasonal cooking, but if you are cooking in Tasmania, there, there really is very set seasons. So there's no other way to cook. Um, it's it's very seasonal cuisine. I think, you know, we're very sort of vegetable driven. I think we have a couple of sort of meals on the menu we've always finished with with a duck dish, um, which is wow. just amazing duck coming from a small farm in the north of the state. Matthew's the farmer there. He runs Strellyfield Farm, and they're incredible birds. Uh, we've sort of had those on from day one. Um, look, uh, it's hard to sort of describe your own style. I think, you know, that's that's a tricky one, but we'll say it's very <laughs> Very produce and and produce driven and seasonal cooking um, dishes that I'm sort of excited on at the moment. I mean, it's it's very much autumn at the moment, and there's pine mushrooms everywhere in the forest. So I've always mm. loved. Um, a, well, I ate a dish in San Sebastian of just a warmed egg yolk with grilled mushrooms and it blew my mind, the simplicity of it, the flavour just is so perfect. So we're kind of doing a bit of a spin on that, um, just mm. a warmed egg yolk with, with beautiful fresh pine mushrooms that we pick the morning before we serve them and the mushrooms are just grilled on the fire until they're sort of just cooked, sliced to order and then a warmed egg yolk. There's a few other bits and pieces on the dish but that's that's really lovely at the moment. Do, do you feel a sense of obligation given that you're a regional restaurant to try and create a sense of place and a, a sort of a, you know, like epitomise the food of Tasmania or the region? Of course, yeah. I mean, it's we're a Tasmanian restaurant through and through. We we use nothing that comes from interstate, um, and that that is the same with our wine list. We only wow. use Tasmanian wines and booze, and it's just yeah, a hundred percent Tasmanian produce. Most of it comes from the south of the state. Um, we are getting some summer truffles from uh, up in the north and then the ducks are kind of from Launceston area and that's about as far as we go. So the food's all coming from about two, 300 kilometres within the restaurant. Um, again, we're sort of using about 80, 90% from our own garden. But wow. look, I think, I think, you know, Tasmania is very much that. In a sense, you know, we're proud of the state. We're proud of the produce. Um, and and most of the good restaurants sort of think the same way. It's it's Tasmania. We're proud of it. We, we have, you know, we use the producers and it's it's a wonderful thing, you know. we Everything that we use that we're not growing, we know the farmer. We've been to the farms predominantly and... Yeah, we know where it comes from. We know where it's been picked. We we know their story, and we tell that to our customers. So anyone coming, they're getting this, you know, it's a, just a, a story of our time, place, the product, producers, mm -hmm. and the moment in the season. And I think that's a very true expression of, of cooking and that's what we're trying to achieve and, and most people that come say we're, we're doing that and it feels really great. 
you, you've worked at um, many venues that have already carved this path that you're on in their own region. Well, what surprised you about sort of running your and building your own restaurant and expressing sort of your true self in that sense? Well, it's, yeah, I mean, like I said earlier, the build was a real challenge financially and time-wise. Um, having worked in some of those really inspired high-end, you know, world-class restaurants, that that was always just kind of a part of the brigade. But seeing how they did it, I think, was really important, especially Brave, how they operated and utilised the garden. So bringing that into my little patch, it was it's always challenging sort of finding your own voice as you've been mm-hmm. influenced so heavily from certain people. But having the garden, it's just been just the most incredible thing and really that dictates what we cook, how we cook. And it sounds very silly, but we go down every morning and, you know, we're picking this, picking that for the menu and something just catches your eye in the corner and it says, I'm ready to go and this is kind of what what you should do. So the menu's just created loosely from the garden and it just kind of happens. I don't know. It's a weird thing, but there's a really lovely connection with that. And, yeah, the garden just tells us when and what to do. And I think over the last year I've really sort of found my style with that. And, look, Mm. the garden says this is what we're doing and it's quite amazing. And most – most chefs that, you know, have very much a large kitchen garden that they work with sort of say the same thing. And I never really got it until we really worked that way ourselves in my own venue. Um, so pretty amazing that that's kind of the how it works and very connected with the land. Um, and then, look, the challenges of running a restaurant in general are enormous. I'd never had a role as a executive chef, let alone running a business. So mm-hmm. in enormous challenges the whole way. And it's it's not an easy game to play in, that's for sure. <laughs> well, the last couple of years have been um, challenging for many and impacted people in different ways. Well, what sort of effect has the pandemic had on you and, and your role in the industry? Well, I mean, I, obviously when the pandemic hit, I mean, sort of the whole industry just closed. So I was working sort of up the East Coast and I'd lost my job. I ended up getting really sick at the time with a, a pretty nasty kind of autoimmune disease that I'm still dealing with now, but I, I'm healthy wow. and good. Um, so that, that kind of all happened at once. I got really sick, COVID hit almost everyone lost their jobs, you know, within the industry. There were shutdowns, lockdowns. Tasmania closed its borders. Um, So we really were quite COVID-free down here. And I was just dealing with with my sickness and and trying to get better. I'd sort of spent about six months um, being really, really sick and and not really doing much. Um, So uh, that was kind of pretty shocking at the time, but covid it kind of just happened together. Um, and then I got better and, and really there were no jobs in, in cooking or very few. So I ended up just kind of landscaping with some friends, which was awesome to be outside and moving again from being really sick. Wow. Um, but look, I mean, it, it didn't really affect me so much in that sense, um, not as much as others who were already operating within the industry. And then obviously opening. I mean, we were still open in COVID. I mean, it's still kind of killing it now, but it's um, we opened very much within the pandemic and it was really hard. We, we didn't really have any interstate visitors coming so we were depending entirely on really Mm. locals and they supported us enormously um we've had great support from tourism tasmania who sort of put us in in a few magazines and and then yeah the borders kind of opened and we just started seeing some really influential players uh, from Sydney and a few other places coming down and just saying, wow, this is awesome. And then they head off and more people come who know them. And, 
Yeah, it's been really great. There's obviously been, you know, challenges with, oh, look, lockdowns and on the mainland mm. especially. We had one snap lockdown here in Tassie where we basically were told on, on our Monday afternoon that you're closing for the week. Um, so as a very small business where, you know, you're really relying on week-to-week uh, income that was a big one that kind of shook us a lot and the next day we just sort of pivoted and and opened as a bottle shop we had heaps of comfy duck legs that we had from our ducks so we were serving packs of comfy duck and and pino and and wow. people came and we made a bit of money to sort of just cover staff wages, but you run at a loss in those things and as a small business that's sometimes detrimental um mm. So look, there's been a lot of challenges, um, but again, we sort of a, a very good model within COVID, being small and and can really, yeah, just I suppose roll with the punches. But um, yeah, it's been devastating to the industry. I feel for for everyone that's that's been you know hit hard. It's it's been shocking to watch. And look, I, I hope we're on the right path to to being able to operate at full capacity um yeah you've rolled the dice and opened a really unique small venue that's really connected to the region um uh, the, it's had a bit of a spotlight shone on it just a, of late has that had an impact on you yeah i mean of course it, it, it always does uh, you put your heart and soul into something you work you know, 90 plus hours, week in, week out, it, it, it's you, you know, it's it's very much you on a plate, you're expressing yourself and your kind of philosophy and, and then to be, or you know, put on a, a pedestal almost is, is quite surreal. I mean, I'm a pretty humble guy and look, I don't really buy into any of that. Essentially, I just want to have time to go surfing. Um, there hasn't <laughs> A lot of that, to be honest. Um, but yeah, look, I think to you know, to be in gourmet, to be nominated as best new restaurant in Australia by Gourmet Traveller, that was an incredible sort of win. Even though we didn't win, we saw that as a win in itself. Um, and then you know their top eighty restaurant awards came out, and it wasn't numbered or anything. It was just sort of the, the best 80 restaurants as such, and, and we were in it. So that's super surreal. Um, we're just quietly doing our thing in a gorgeous part of Tassie, and, and yeah, it's it's amazing that, you know, the word gets out and, and people are talking about it. But, look, it, it's, it's really great. Um, we're thrilled that we're getting attention and – some nice kind of awards and accolades. It's not everything, of course. It definitely helps with generating, uh, I suppose, the right clientele um, and generates better business, which has been amazing. Um, Mm. But, yeah, it's just kind of surreal. Like I said, we're just quietly doing our thing. and, And for the kind of Australia or, you know, some parts of the world to be watching it feels it feels amazing and and we're just stoked about that um but we never opened to be the greatest or the best or anything we just wanted to to cook really good food and be connected to that that part of tassie um and we're slowly really finding our feet within it so it feels really great i must admit in, in some ways, you kind of fell into the industry and yet you've created this really incredible offering that's really quite personal. Mm. What do you love about what you do? Well, it's it's um, oh, it's hard to say. I mean, you, you, you're you running on adrenaline, which is it, it's addictive. It's almost like a drug, if you can say, um, a good mm. service with great customers, who are who are just thrilled of what you've sort of done and put out, and uh, that feels just amazing. So I think I think pleasing people within that, expressing yourself is is always really great to be able to do that on a platform day to day and have people really love it. That always is wonderful. Um, I think the industry is really inspired. It's you're constantly meeting really 
interesting and, and inspired people. So that's probably one thing that I always get a real kick out of. Um, and then just, I mean, I love eating. So to be <laughs> able to, to, to cook good food, to eat it, to, to go to restaurants and for people to know who you are and for them to sort of cook good food for you, I, I think it's beautiful. So it's a wonderful industry. Um, yeah, I, I definitely enjoy being a part of it and, and get a real kick out of pleasing people. Well, Tim, congratulations on what you've built there and look forward to seeing what you build from, from now on as well. We've loved having you on Deep in the Weeds today to hear your story. Uh, please keep in touch and we'll catch up again soon. Yeah, no worries, Huck. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a pleasure and uh, look forward to catching up. Cheers, mate. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.